The phone conversation between fantasy veterans Bob Harris and Matt Waldman is a quick and dirty rundown of players, units, or teams from Sunday's games. Feel it or fuck it is our instant verdict on the fantasy value of a player or situation, not the ability, effort, or character of the player. This is just how two old-timers in this industry talk when they got a lot of cover in a little time. Do one. <laughs> Good morning, Matt Waldman. It's uh, the free agent week is upon us, and I know you don't care about any of this because why? It's rookie scouting portfolio time. How are we coming on the project, sir? We are nearing the halfway point today, so um, is that's a good thing. Running back chapter about to go to my editors. Um, I believe it'll probably be close to 300 pages. Um, it's a great running back class. I think we're going. We should talk about it today. I think a little bit. I think we will. Uh, so I'm looking. I'm counting days. How many days to the first? Uh, one, two, three. Oh, you have enough days left. There's plenty of days. I think we're going to be all right. Wide receivers is always the bear. So this is. I'm. I'm. I, I've. I've conquered the wolf now i'm about to take on the bear so we'll see how that the bear goes. will growl uh there have been a few developments this week in advance of the start of free agency and we'll get on some of the free agent subjects here as well but uh the big news uh, of the week uh last week was dj moore being traded to the chicago bears in exchange for the first pick overall uh so we'll have a que- couple questions about this here uh dj moore is he a catalyst to bring out the best in justin Fields? I think he could be because one of the biggest things with Justin Fields where I saw as a potential flaw with him was some of his throws in the middle of the field, especially the intermediate middle of the field. That's where DJ Moore shines, actually. Um, Now, I think that this could be a situation where Moore's skills as a route runner in the middle of the field will really force Justin Fields to refine what he did, you know, especially at Ohio State, where that's where I saw him struggle at times. But I don't think it was such a big deal for Fields or a flaw that, you know, that he's going to sink with this. I think, if anything, Moore gives them that number one receiver who can make plays anywhere on the field. Moore got better as an outside rail shot receiver over the course of his NFL career. And I think they're going to be able to do enough to free him in a way where he should have some career years in Chicago. And I think this is going to elevate that offense. Yeah, but something you mentioned, Brad Spielberg at Pro Football Focus put out a tweet. Uh, Fields led the NFL with a 66.7% completion percentage on throws of 10 to 19 yards downfield. Guess who has the second most targets in the NFL on passes of 10 to 19 yards downfield over the last three years? Yes. DJ Moore, also a consistent high-end producer, even with a series of lousy quarterbacks. I know we said this about Allen Robinson, and I hate to bring that comparison up, who's now playing with the best quarterback he ever has. It didn't work out for him, uh, but I think I'm feeling this one. I think this works out for DJ Moore. DJ Moore, uh, wide receiver one potential for fantasy purposes, feel or fuck it? Fuck it. Just because I think they're going to run enough and that... Yep. And, and Fields is a, a scrambler that the volume is just not going to be quite there. Top 12, I think pretty pretty confident. Top 15, easily. All right, fair enough. So, other side of that coin, Matt Waldman. Uh, a lot of talk that uh, C.J. Stroud will be the apple of Carolina's eyes. I know Josh McCown, new quarterbacks coach, is talking about it. Feeling a fucking C.J. Stroud is the first pick overall, or the right pick for Carolina. Let's put it that way. I'm feeling it, but I think there's three good picks for Carolina at that quarterback spot that I wouldn't go too crazy about, even though fans might go one way or the other. But Stroud is certainly in the mix there, and and I understand it from the standpoint that came from a big program, safe pick, probably the safest pick of the three quarterbacks in this class, um, and certainly a terrific thrower from the pocket. So if you're looking for a pocket quarterback, who is going to be able to make all the throws, who sees the field well, and is going to be able to elevate the talent around him as a thrower, purely as a thrower, I think Stroud is your best bet on that end. It's going to be a process, people in Carolina. Don't get too excited just yet. Okay, uh, the Ravens uh, slapped the non-exclusive franchise tag on the Lamar Jackson. This, to me, is not a surprise. Um, they've been trying to get a deal done with him for quite a while. So, like, I know there's a lot of talk out there. There's collusion. It's all these things. Okay, if you want to sit here and say a bunch of people sitting around saying we're not giving guaranteed contracts is collusion, I don't know that they all signed a a blood oath pact or anything, but but probably, yes, I can see how it's in their best interest. So if you define that as collusion, absolutely, they're colluding. Also, absolutely, 
These guys have been trying to get a deal done with Lamar for over a year now, and they haven't been able to do it. Could this be, feel or fuck it, is this an effort to just crowdsource this negotiation to get it done? I think it is, though I would love, I would be feeling the idea of seeing all the NFL owners in black cloaks with hoods over them, pointy hoods, and just get a picture of them because it would probably be pretty apropos, though I'm not sure the cloak color is right, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> but, um, black would work. Red might work, too. Um, maybe another color, too. But then I would say, looking at this with um, Lamar Jackson, you know, Russ Landy and I talked about this on Scout Talk last week, and, and really the quick summary is this. is Lamar Jackson obviously is a top playmaker in the NFL and an excellent young quarterback, regardless of the stats that you're looking at that may say, is he top five or not? Well, you can say that for the for over a two-year period for a lot of quarterbacks who wind up in the top five in and out over the course of a 15-year career. So contact me in another three-year window, and we might be talking about him as a top five quarterback, just like we did with you know a number of guys. Second of all, it is a unique offense that they got to put around him because he is not a good outside thrower. And a result of him not being, you know, a great outside the numbers thrower means that there are a lot of teams that decide we have these pieces in pay, place. Adding Lamar Jackson, as good as he is, might not fit our offense as well. We need somebody else. So we would rather go with somebody else. And I think that's what it is, is that there are some teams that might think Lamar Jackson isn't a great fit for them, but they recognize he's a good quarterback. And I think the Ravens are saying, look, man, I think we know our market for you and you want to test it out. And we're okay with that because we think at the end, you're not going to get a better deal than what we offer you. So go ahead. We've got time. We've given you Todd Munkin, who is going to be a, good to be able to, to, to work with you. Um, and we're excited about having you, but we don't blame you for trying to go get your best deal. and We'll be patient. Right, and, and and we'll hope that Lamar doesn't blame them for trying to get their best deal, and you know maybe not sign that tag or that the exclusive, non exclusive tag for some period of time as the offense is installed. So that to me is the you know the the danger of this negotiation. You want Lamar happy and in camp. I don't know what's going to make Lamar happy because we don't get a, we don't hear a lot about these negotiations, which honestly is ideal. For, so if you're out there, listener, and you're hearing about negotiations, you're hearing about the most contentious part. Yeah. That's all you're hearing. Yeah. It's sides posturing, trying to gain some kind of leverage or perceive leverage. I don't even think they gain anything by this public perception because I don't think people I mean, who do these negotiations really care what you think about them. Yeah, so, you should have you seen you should have seen behind the scenes oh, when I was trying to negotiate for those liquor oh, bottles that you got back there. Oh yeah, you, you know, I mean, and I don't even drink it. I'm not giving them up. That. See, there you go. <laughs> I don't even drink it. I'm not giving them up. So so yeah. So uh, give this one a little time to breathe. But I think the the Ravens front office has never been accused of malpractice uh, wide receivers aside uh you know they <laughs> this team has been a pretty consistent track record of uh, of, of making you know building good rosters so we'll see uh, how this one works out so the the packers uh, just let me frame this because uh, mark murphy talked uh, i think it was on last saturday the the team ceo and he was asked if uh you know there was a scenario where aaron Rodgers is still the starting quarterback for Green Bay in 2023, his answer was, I quote, yeah, I mean, unless things don't work out the way we want, yeah. <laughs> I mean, basically he's saying, yes, we want him to win. If things work out the way we want, there will be no Aaron Rodgers. So <clears throat> we'll see, we'll find out soon enough about all that, Matt Waldman, and probably maybe in the next half hour as we record this right before the deadline. But the Packers seeming eagerness to move on from Aaron Rodgers, the other fuck. Well, I think they, they realize that they still can wring value out of Aaron Rodgers through a trade. And that at some point or another, they're going to have to see what their investment in Jordan Love is going to bear. And and I think that, you know, none of us are really going to know. But as someone who watched Jordan Love, you know, at Utah State, he wasn't nearly as good as what the what his draft capital, you know, in intent, you know, at least implied. But at the same time, when you give a guy as many years as you've given him, to sit behind an all-timer, you know, and with his physical ability, you, I have elevated optimism for Jordan Love, and I think that the Packers have seen enough, and they, if there's a team that's been successful with that, let's let the quarterback sit for at least a year or two plan and see what happens after we do that. Um, 
that's a team, that's an organization that I would trust enough to say, let's give Jordan Love a chance. Let's at least get something out of Aaron Rodgers and be excited about that and know that if Jordan Love isn't the answer, we at least got mm. um, capital out of getting rid of Aaron Rodgers towards the end of his career that's still worthwhile to help us build and get a, right, a good quarterback if Love isn't that answer. I feel like... This is me a feeling the Packers being willing to move on with Aaron Rodgers. They've had enough of this nonsense. We go back a couple of weeks where we're talking about the Bob McGinn comments and whatever you think of Bob McGinn. Yeah, I it's it seems like at least the portion where they're all in on Jordan Love or willing to be all in on Jordan Love, whether they're disgusted with Aaron Rodgers act or routine by now. I suspect they probably are. I, they've also seen this movie before. They did it with uh, Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers in the past. So maybe they're just trying to nip this one in the bud. Uh, I don't feel like we have enough information to believe or feel or fuck uh, Jordan Love at this point. The Packers apparently do, however. By the way, just quickly going back to Lamar Jackson before. So today is, you know, teams can begin negotiations, do things. Nobody can talk to, to, to Lamar Jackson. You can talk to players' agents. You can't talk to the players. He's his own agent. So that's going to delay this. And there may be your teams that won't get in on this because they can't start their free agency without knowing what kind of money they're going to invest in Lamar Jackson. So that might be a, a little sticking point for people as well. All right. Uh, the Miami Dolphins reportedly will pick up to a Tonga Valoa's fifth year option. They keep telling us they believe in him, Matt. Should we believe they believe in him yet? Feel it or fuck it? Yeah, I think we should believe that they believe in him. Um, and I think it's convenient, though, to say that they be they believe that they that we can believe that they believe in him because they have a good depth chart and at their quarterback position and a promising player who's their third guy who might wind up being their backup in Skylar Thompson. Um, so I'm still believing in Tua. I'm still believing in Skylar Thompson. Um, the the Tua one, my belief is a little bit shorter, mainly because you know NFL teams have discovered one of the flaws that he has is that he just doesn't have that big arm to be able to hose the ball to the to the outside in a way that um you know it, uh that would really help this offense with the way defenses have adjusted inside um but at the same time um you know picking up the fifth year option means that well they're not giving him a second contract this you know soon yet so it says we're going to wait a little bit longer to see how this bears out but they feel they believe in what they've seen with him to at least ride out the the all possible lengths of the deal and give Skylar Thompson a little bit more time because I think they're quietly excited about what he is um, in terms of his value and what he showed um, in the playoffs and in spot duty. My Superflex Dynasty shares agree with that last <coughs> portion of this. Also, they're waiting to see what Tom Brady's doing. Is he playing with kittens or is he playing football? That's what we'll find out soon enough. Uh, Trey Lance. Uh, Kenny, so Brock Purdy underwent the, shoulder, the elbow surgery uh, this past Friday, he leaves the timetable pretty tight, Matt. He's got three months, and he'll start throwing uh, another three months. So six months before he's practicing, that's pretty close to the season. Uh, Trey uh, Lance leveraging that recovery time, that window to win back the starting job. Feel it or fuck it, sir. I'm feeling the idea of that, um, you know, because certainly with a good mini camp, with a good off season, and if he's doing the things that Kyle Shanahan wants him to do, it could just he could pretty much be a slam dunk option in that regard. The biggest issue is what all of the the media, the um, and people who follow Kyle Shanahan and folks who have the conspiratorial idea of Kyle Shanahan doing this whole kind of number of saying, "Oh, this is going to be my chance to like just pull the trap door on Trey Lance and get rid of him because I never wanted him in the first place," and I was. You know, and and I'm gonna nitpick him to death like I nitpick other players to death, and and you know, and just justify having Purdy because he does exactly what I want him to do, and he's just like a little automaton in my video game, and I can I can actually play NFL quarterback the way that I always want to. That's the complaint a lot of quarterbacks have about West Coast offensive coaches is that they treat them like video game you know, pixels as opposed to actual like decision makers on the field. Um, and I'm sure that Kyle Shanahan has probably been guilty of that to some extent, but I still believe that Trey Lance as a prospect is much better than Brock Purdy. Um, but Purdy has shown that he is good enough to be, um, 
you know, a compelling backup who might actually be a journeyman. And there are going to be people who say, well, he's more than that. He's going to be a, a top starter in the league. Look what he did this year. And I would say that was all very impressive. But let, let's give him, you know, another 18 to 24 games if he gets that, in, you know, to be able to start before we make that conclusion. Right. I, I, I would totally agree with all that, except I would not underplay the notion that Kyle Shanahan really likes having a little miniature Kyle Shanahan in the head of his quarterback doing all the things he wants to do, yep. pulling the levers, as it were. All right. Uh, let's look at some uh, rookie stuff, uh, more rookie stuff. Uh, the Revenge of the Gap scheme, Matt. Are you feeling that or fucking it? Tell us about this. Yeah, I'm kind of feeling this. That, and what I mean by it is that the that last year, Really, if you go back in the past 10 years, the past 10 years, everybody's talking about, we're going to see with Chip Kelly entering the NFL and other teams, and maybe it was longer than that, but as t more college coaches started to have influence in the NFL, you started to see more offenses spread out. And with the spread in, out of the offenses, with more of a vertical game emphasis, um, what you ended up and what you ended up seeing is that defenses had to react by spreading themselves out too, and they had to get lighter and smaller at the linebacker positions, at the defensive line positions, so that they could drop more players, that they could be a little quicker to get pressure, as well as being able to have you know linebackers who were basically safeties disguised as linebackers. So for the past few years, guys like myself and others have been saying. One day the NFL is going to look up and go, you know what? The answer to all this is just the run game. We're going to ram the ball down their the spread out defense's throat. Our our linemen are still bit are actually bigger and stronger now. Have the advantage to actually now run gap plays. Where in the past, you know, ten years ago, you had to run zone because you weren't athletic enough to dominate play after play after play against defensive fronts. Now you can run counter and power and um toss and do that and on top of that they the we saw a few teams be able to do that the 49ers one of them where they took wide zone which is a a, a play where you have three options really to bounce to cram it where the the play is intended to go or to cut back and that requires a fair bit of manipulation and skill be between the snap and the exchange point for a running back to figure out where they're going to manipulate the, the defenders and the blockers. It's a skill that often means that these running backs don't have to be just big, fast, and, and, stro you know, and strong and just hit it hard. Um, so for years, a lot of scouting of running backs was more along the, the processing side of the game and the, the refined footwork, and you didn't always have to be super fast you had to just be able to accelerate, stop, start, and be able to use your footwork in a very um, intuitive and skillful way. And now with guys like Shanahan, they said, you know what? We don't want our guys to think. We want them to all be little Kyle Shanahan's in our head. So if we get all the blockers to basically do the work by running wide zone kind of like a toss play then we're simulating a kickoff return it's so simple we could get a wide receiver who's a punt returner to do it and we can have them run to the outside and just hit one hole and then when we draft a, a running back or two who actually are smart at being able to look at things in their patient we don't want them to do that we 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 think if they're smart and patient to be able to do that, then we can get them to just make quick decisions. Well, that didn't work for um, Trey Sermon because he <laughs> he was too much of a thinker in the way that they didn't want him to be. But they could get a late round guy in Elijah Mitchell who doesn't have the nuance, and then he can get the head downfield. Another guy like that, Cord Cordero Patterson. Bill Belichick was the one who kind of stumbled on this a little bit too on the East Coast because he he took Cordero Patterson used them on gap plays and toss plays from the I formation where they said, you know what? You were a wide receiver who had all pro level skills, except for the fact that from the whiteboard to the field, you were a slow translator with that. And that doesn't mean you're dumb. It just means it's a hard thing to do for a lot of players. And he, he needed too much coaching to be a top wide receiver every day because the, the translation of game plan from the board to the field was too much for him. So if you can put him in a simple, simpler role where you say, look, you're a great open field runner. We're going to simulate, simulate the open field. This is what happens. You're going to hit it. And he did great. And I think teams look at all this and say, you know what? 
now we can use gap schemes. We don't need as many running backs who are as high end in, in their refinement with certain skills. That widens the pool now. It's a deeper, wider pool now for running backs. And that means <clears> that the way that I used to rail against like media and say, well, it's all just instinctive anyway, and these running backs are just dumb 215-pound guys who just somehow have a gift from the gods that they can move in a certain way and you know do the you know and do this by instinct. Well, it's going to play into that more, even though gap scheme has its own intricacies too. But it is going to widen the pool, so that means that now we're looking at probably more late round guys who are maybe not as when the scouts look at them and say they don't have as much ability and nuance. Well, they, if they go to a gap scheme, it might not matter. That so the corollary to that, and I'll just say quickly is that. I, I'm feeling that idea that the revenge is about to happen and wreak havoc in how we choose running backs. But at the same time, it's very possible that a lot of good zone runners are good gap runners too. So it may not make as much of a way, but I'm going for the doomsday. The, the little Shanahan, I don't need a little Shanahan in my head. I, I, I can see this clearly, the direction that the running back position is taken. And you're right. When you see the Tyler Algiers of the world turned into things at various points in time, expect to see more of that. It might mean some more flash in the pans. And yes. by flash in the pans, I mean those of you chasing, chasing Tyler Algier, don't overpay. Okay, uh, well, let's move on to more rookies, more rookie running backs. Uh, the, the Golden Hurricanes, they're blowing hard. Tulsa's Daenerys Prince is the biggest sleeper in the running back class. Feel it or fuck it? I'm feeling that he could be. I think he's one of the three most. But I would say one that is probably... <clears throat> I'm not going to give you my biggest sleeper, but my my second biggest sleeper. What? Wait. Not yet. Not yet. Yep. Yep. Going to have to wait. April one, baby. MattWaldman.com. But we'll say um, Christopher Brooks. Christopher Brooks out of Cal, who is now by at BYU. 6'1", 235. Kind of that you know James Connor, Gus Edwards type of size. Good burst. Good hands as a receiver can really be a good finisher. Matt, if you put him in Detroit and let him be the B back to DeAndre Swift's A back, um, you could you could get a lot of that Jamal Williams kind of thing going on and maybe a little more because he is a piano mover of a running back with some really underrated skill. He was the star of the Hula Bowl, which, you know, Hula Bowl people go, well, that's that's not unbelievable. But, you know, what's interesting about that too is that um, being the star of the Hula Bowl, being that kind of piano mover guy, and I say Detroit, well, Detroit could use that second back. They may go for a cheaper option. And there's a common tie. The guy who I think is representing him or helping training him is is former Detroit Lion Zach Zenner. Um, but yeah, I think Christopher Brooks is kind of at even maybe a Samaj P. Ryan type of running back who, you know, good enough that you could say if we needed to use him, he could be a starter for us. He could be a, a strong committee guy, or he's going to, you know, he, I think he could be a fantasy option. I'll just put it that way. Somewhere my friend Kyle Dvorak from NBC Sports Edge heard you say Zach Center and said, Dr. Zach Center? Where? <laughs> Paging him. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, former TC, uh, we got, okay. Uh, Zach, uh, Zach Evans, a uh, lot of questions about him. Uh, where are we at on him? Yeah, because he's had this quixotic journey through recruiting where he the, the University of Georgia had recruited him. He signed a letter of intent. He was a five-star prospect, seen as the number one running back out of high school. And then he was linked to several teams after that and wound up like losing some of his stars and like just kind of was unknown. And he had supposedly had run-ins with high school coaches. And it was like the nightmare recruiting thing from the surface. Winds up at TCU with a disciplinarian in Gary Patterson. Plays well for a, a season or season and a half, but had some in, some minor injuries. Um, suffered a turf toe. Um, and then Kendrick Miller's behind him. And next thing you know, he winds up at Ole Miss and splits time with a guy by the name of Quinshawn Junkins, who is probably one of the two best freshman running back performers last year. And so it seemed like the, the shine kind of came off Zach Evans. When you watch the film, though, I still think he might have the best vision decision-making in this class. Um, 
He came in at 202 at the combine, which also freaked out the metrics guys. But running backs regularly drop 10 pounds or 15 pounds. Like it's nothing to run for this event because in your early 20s, you you can you can probably eat like three big meals and gain 10 pounds. And then you can stop eating for a week or two and drop 15. So he's, you know, it's not that big of a thing there. And then with the recruiting journey, from all accounts, he's a good kid. 3.75 GPA um, as a freshman um, and had the all academic rookie honors, was known as a good kid in high school. He basically, he probably made some immature decisions because the one family member in his that was his kind of guidance was his grandfather and his grandfather passed away the year before the recruiting cycle really got into effect. And he handled his own recruiting, which is something that it, it that's going to be tough. So I think there was some immaturity there, but nothing on a level where you're thinking getting in trouble, doing illicit substances, things mm-hmm. that are going to deter you from the team. The biggest thing that got him suspended was that he wouldn't give up his cell phone before a championship game in high school um, which was by team policy, he wouldn't give it up. And as a result, he, he wasn't allowed to play in the championship, which is a big deal when you think about maturity. But moving forward, everyone said in TCU he was a good kid. Um, and really the big reason he left is that Gary Patterson told TCU folks that th- there were 30 players that were probably going to leave TCU, including Evans, because the NIL deal that TCU or TCU wasn't doing well with their NIL structure and getting deals for these kids. And so he went to Ole Miss where he could get an NIL deal and he just wound up in a, you know, in a rotation with a really good back, just like a lot of University of Miami backs did and University of Georgia and Auburn and Ohio State backs have. So yeah, I'm feeling Zach Evans still. I'm not uh, and you can fuck the whole like off field stuff. I think you just look to the tape. He's a really good running back. You mentioned those horny toes. I call them horn toes. From it's an Arizona thing. Horn frog. Uh, TCU teammate, former TCU teammate, Kendra Miller. Uh, better than Zach Evans? He could be. I mean, that's it's that close for me. I have Zach Evans ranked above Kendra Miller. But the thing about Miller is he is a sudden player. Very sudden acceleration. Um, good contact balance, uh, catches the ball, very promising as a pass catcher, um, good hand-eye coordination overall to make some tough plays. And he's big enough to be able to, you know, there's no questions about his size. He decided he wasn't going to skip the cupcakes before, you know, before any type of workouts. He's a he's a solid 215, probably could be 220. To me, he's what Lamar Miller was entering the league, which was smooth, sudden, versatile, um, and can be um, powerful enough to carry the load. All right, so we're about three minutes away from the opening of the free agent tampering period as we record this Monday, about two minutes before noon. We'll find out if Aaron Rodgers is actually going to hold people hostage uh, with his decision, because as soon as the, the, the negotiating window opens, the Jets would like to start negotiating, and until they know what's going on, they can't. But there was one deal, Matt, before we get out of here. Uh, John U. Smith was traded to Atlanta. I don't think this is a big deal. You know, obviously didn't get a lot done in uh, New England. They gave him up for a seventh-round pick, but he is familiar with uh, Arthur Smith. They do use two tight ends on occasion there. But more, more to the point, Kyle Pitts, where are we at on him? I'm optimistic with this deal, but I love trolling everybody for the idea of seeing like seeing all of them freak out about it. But if you think about it, um, Kyle's, Kyle Pitts is best used on the outside as a wide receiver or as a guy you can put in the slot. And so when you get another tight end who is a legitimate threat to catch a football, that means that you can leverage that to get better matchups for Kyle Pitts where you move him around and two tight end sets are very difficult for defenses to defend because there's a lot of options that they have to to cover so it's actually a very good trade it's better than having like a lee smith in there who's gonna you know his best route is basically one step and turn around um you know so you you know you're and so you're the fact that you're giving him a good tight end because they had hayden hurst two years before and you saw what kyle smith Kyle, Kyle Pitts did with Hayden Hurst. This is their attempt to get a cheaper version of that, probably. You know, the free agency window is now officially open, and I lied. I want to squeeze in one more. Calvin Ridley returned, reinstated this past week. Does he jump right back into a wide receiver one role? Is he that guy? 
he, he's close. He's close enough that I, I you know, I, you know, if I were like the, if I were like some persnickety judge, I'd say I allow it. You know, even though that he might be in that blur of high end wide receiver two, not quite really a primary guy. And with that offense, it might not matter. Right. Uh, maybe that's the final point. Feeling or fucking the Jaguars offense being one of the feel best it. units in the league. Feel it. Totally feel All it. All right. There we have it. That's enough for today. We got to go do some real work, Matt. Love you. Goodbye. Love you. Bye.